Please open your Bibles, if you have one, to the book of James chapter 2. Book of James chapter 2. And while you turn there, I'll give you an idea of where we'll be heading in the next couple weeks. Uh, You remember we're studying through the book of James and Psalm 119 in tangent. As we finish a section of James, we'll do a week or two of Psalm 119. And we took, I think, 11 11 Sundays to get through the first chapter of James. Uh, The rest of the book will be much quicker pace. I believe we'll get through chapter 2 in four messages. Chapter 2 has two sections that connect, one on the sin of partiality. We'll look at the first half of that this morning, the first seven verses. Pastor Daniel and I will be at Camp Appanoose next week, so we're having a guest preacher fill the pulpit, our own Jacob Moore. Um, And he will actually be teaching a text from 1 Corinthians that actually dovetails very beautifully with the passage we're looking at in James. I'll return, finish up through verse 13 of chapter 2. And then um, Pastor Daniel will preach the next two Sundays, finishing chapter 2. So we're going to be going through chapter 2, our plan is, in four weeks. Given that, I'd like to read the first 13 verses of chapter 2, even though we'll be just looking at the first seven, as it comprises the unit. We'll be looking at a sin this morning that I don't think is on many of our radars. You know, when people make the list of the seven deadly sins, partiality isn't usually one of them. And James singles it out, and he speaks about it in strong terms. It is a great evil. So we need to understand it. We need to apply the mirror to ourselves and see where our reflection is out of conformity with God's word, and we need to make adjustments as necessary. Let's begin by reading James chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. My brothers... Show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while to the poor man you say, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs in the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? But you've dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you? The ones who drag you into court, are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. 13 verses to deal with the sin, the evil of what the ESV translates as partiality. Probably not a sin we give great attention to, but James's language is unmistakable. Look at the end of verse four. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Or, in verse 9, if you show partiality, you are committing sin. So we're dealing with sin. We're dealing with evil. We need to understand it. Partiality, probably not even a term we use all that often. So we're going to look at the first seven verses this morning, and we're going to look at them in three parts. In verse 1, James gives his command. 
Um, he, he forms the section like he does most frequently with a address to plural my brothers, and by implication brothers and sisters, with an imperative verb. So here, my brothers show no partiality. That's generally how James begins new sections, or most frequently. Then he's going to give us a vivid illustration of the practice of partiality in verses 2 to 4. It's a hypothetical. It's an if-then. It's a big, long if-then. If, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da, then you've become evil judges with evil motives. And then to further explain why this is so wicked and, and, and we need to understand its sinfulness, he, by asking rhetorical questions, explains the evil of partiality. Because I think part of the problem is what you see happening here, while you, while you might feel a little embarrassed about it if it were to happen, if, if the scenario James and Vidges played out here, you might feel that wasn't good. Would we view it as evil? Would we view it as sin? Would we see how it, it's antithetical to our faith and the Lord of glory? Hopefully by the end of this morning we will. So let's take a look at first a strong exhortation against partiality. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. So he's addressing Christians, believers in the assembly. And he gives the command clearly, show no partiality. Now, the word partiality is a word that James likely invented or the Christian community invented. Outside of James and three uses in Paul, there is no use of this word in Greek literature. What it appears to be is a Hebrewism. The Hebrew phrase in the Old Testament that James just sort of creates or the early church community created That's significant because that tells us then that we're going to find the word's meaning not by taking the parts together like butterfly. It's it's flying butter. No, it's what it meant in the Old Testament. You're blank here. Partiality literally means, the Greek, to receive a face. To receive a face. It's a Hebrewism. Turn back to Deuteronomy chapter um, 16. Deuteronomy 16. It's also there in 117. It's, 16 is probably a clear example. Um, Deuteronomy 16, verses 19 to 20. And again, we're turning here because the meaning of the term will be found in how the Old Testament uses it. J- James just brings it across. Um, it's two words in Hebrew. He just makes it one word in, in Greek. Um, And so he's clearly applying this principle. Deuteronomy 16, verses 19 to 20. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality. Hebrew, you shall not receive a face. You shall not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of the righteous. Justice, and only justice you shall follow. They may live and inherit the land the Lord your God is giving you. Turn, turn over, actually, to Leviticus 19. I think that's actually the text James has in mind. He's going to quote explicitly from it in our next section. Leviticus 19, where the great, greatest, second greatest commandment is found. Leviticus chapter 19. James is going to quote verse 18. You shall love your neighbors yourself. And this notion of Um, Receiving a face is used in verse 15. So I think it's likely this entire section is in James's mind as he's writing. Verse 15, you shall do no injustice in courts. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. But in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people. And you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So it's used in context of judgment and justice and and giving someone what is their due. And the idea seems plain enough. It's to look at the externals. James makes that clear from his usage. 
is to look at the externals. You're, you're blank here, and I think putting the command into uh, a positive light, do not make judgments about people based upon external appearance or economic circumstance. We may well be able to add to that list, but I think James clearly gives us those two things. Do not make judgments about people based on external appearance or economic circumstances. I think even some translations use this word prejudice to prejudge. Overlapping concepts, to be sure. Partiality. So, in the Old Testament, the judges were forbidden from taking into account in their judgments the wealth of the poverty of the person in front of them. Justice only justice. You don't put your finger on the scales either way. You give just judgments. You don't take into account someone's face. It's a beautiful face. It's an ugly face. It's beautiful clothing. It's ugly clothing. It's not to be factored in. Now, he makes an interesting statement here in verse 1. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Literally, with. Do not try to combine partiality with the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the idea. The, the, the blank here, because faith in Jesus is incompatible with partiality. That's part of what he wants us to see. You can't put the two together. You can't take faith in Jesus and combine it with partiality. It's a contradiction in terms. It's a contradiction in terms. This is, after all, one of two times in the book of James where he names Jesus. Some have complained that Jesus doesn't show up very often in in James. He doesn't by name. Twice. There's no cross in James. There's no resurrection in James. There's no atonement in James. Luther called it a right straw epistle because of that. What there is, however, is a tremendous amount of Jesus in James as James reteaches, reapplies Jesus' public teaching. We've seen that. Virtually everything James says comes out of the Sermon on the Mount, comes out of Jesus' public teaching. He's taking Jesus' teaching and his life and ministry, by and large, is what James is doing, and applying it to the churches scattered in the dispersion. And in that sense, Jesus is very present in the epistle. I think we'll see that this morning as well. But this is one of two times in the book he names the Lord of glory. He names him. Why why does he do that? You cannot, do not combine partiality, face receiving, with faith And our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he gives them this other title, Lord of Glory. (laughs) Well, I think your second point here, because Christ, for the Christian, has come to define and direct our view of glory. Stepping back, what's really at stake here is what's worthy of honor and laud and glory. We're going to see that they dishonor the poor man. By implication, they honor the rich man. And we worship a crucified peasant Messiah. And he redefines and put on, puts on his head the human wisdom approaches to glory and honor, power and majesty. That, I think, is the idea. And he reminds us, you can't combine faith in a Lord of glory, a Jewish peasant nailed on a tree as a criminal, and marry that with human favoritism based on human values. It's an oxymoron. The early church was mocked precisely along those lines. Once the Romans and the Greeks discovered the Christians worship as divine, a man put to death as a common criminal, not a rich man, a peasant, a nothing, a nobody. And yet for us, Jesus Christ is our wisdom and our glory and our honor. You you can't take these two value systems and meld them together. You must not. I think that's partly why he views it as such a great evil, because in doing so, you really belie and undermine the faith itself. So the command, do not show partiality, do not mix it together with faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Don't, Don't mix them. Now, to give us a better idea of what he's talking about here. He's going to give us an example. But by the way, the only other times in the New Testament th- that word is used, partiality, is to tell us God doesn't do this. 
Here's another reason why you can't mix it. It's, it's opposite to God's character and nature. So let me read to you Romans 2.11. For God shows no partiality. God does not receive faces. Or Ephesians 6.9. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. God's not impressed, master, that you have got many slaves He's not a receiver of faces. He's impartial. Or Colossians 3.25. The wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done. There is no partiality. So the other three times this word is used is to emphatically tell us this is not what God is like. He does not do this. So here's another reason not to try to mix it with our faith. You try to mix partiality with our faith, you're, you're mixing something that is definitionally ungodly. Not like God. But there's more. He gives us a vivid illustration. A vivid illustration of the practice of partiality. James is very, very practical. and So he doesn't want to leave it as just a concept. Here's his example. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and If you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Verses two to four is one long conditional sentence in Greek, um, which is why I framed it for if and if then. That's the flow of the sentence. So if the first sets the conditions are true, If what he describes in the first half, first two-thirds of these verses is true, then the conclusion, the then, is also true. If this is true, that is true. He's not saying whether this is happening. We, We can't predict how frequently this would happen. Clearly, it's enough of a temptation that James thinks it's worth expressing and spending some time on. It certainly appears to be a very real danger and temptation for the churches, but we we got no business trying to guess how often this is happening but james wants to highlight it as evil what happens the 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 uh the logic the flow is pretty straightforward in some senses this is a mundane thing or you could be viewed as such maybe something mildly distasteful mildly gauche but james wants to show us the great evil that it is for first we have two different men entering the assembly of the saints James here literally uses the word synagogue in verse 2, indicating, I think, partly how old in the Christian life this is. The early Christians would meet in the synagogue until they were driven out. Although I think here it's the people, not the location that's in view. I should also pause and suggest one other thing. Some commentators and maybe even some of your study notes have suggested that this isn't a worship gathering like we are now, but actually a Christian um, judicial gathering. In 1 Corinthians 6... Paul tells the Corinthians, don't go before unbelievers to settle your disputes. Settle them yourself. So there is a legitimate biblical basis for Christians to gather and render a verdict. Has this person wronged this person? Does this person owe this person something? And some have suggested that's what's going on here. The the, the basis is because that word, receiving a face, is so strongly connected with justice and judgments in the Old Testament. Against that view is the fact that apparently these two men show up as visitors and unknown. What's critical to understanding this sin is nothing else is known about them. Nothing else is described about them except how they're dressed. It's not their character. Presumably they're unknown. They're visitors. That would seem like a strange group of people to have as adjudicants at a law court. A plaintiff, you know, that doesn't make a ton of sense. So I do think this is a worship service of some sort, a gathering of Christians and these two people show up, and they show up most likely as visitors. Certainly in James's evaluation, nothing other than their externals are taken into view. You get a man wearing gold rings, literally a gold-fingered man, meaning more than one ring. Enough rings that his hand from a distance looks golden. This is opulence. Um, a ring was not uncommon. Many rings, a gold-fingered man, that's... That's something else. 
and fine clothing, literally bright clothing, clean, sharp colors, not dingy from dirt and repeated washing, expensive, well cared for clothing. I was wrong, Linda, not purple, just bright clothing, bright clothing. And so what can we learn from that? He's got money, some amount of money. He can afford golden jewelry. He can afford to wear bright, shiny clothing and keep it that way, either changing it out enough frequently or buying new clothing so that it doesn't become dull and dirty and grungy. All we can learn about this man is he's at a certain economic status. Whether he's super rich, I don't know, but he has some level of means. And the comparison with the other man is equally external. A poor man in shabby clothing shows up. So two men, presumably visitors, walk into a gathering of Christians, I think for worship, and all we're looking at is their external, their dress, their appearance, and certain assumptions that can be made about their socioeconomic status as a result. That's all that's being considered here. Poor man, And a man with gold rings and fine clothing. And then that leads to two very different responses. The body response. These are plural verbs. James is not envisioning a single individual acting. When they say things, it's you all. So this is the response of the church. Maybe not every individual, but enough people that you could say that's how the church responded. And here's how they respond. If you pay attention, literally look favorably upon the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges of evil motives? So they look on the wealthy man with favor, and then they honor him by giving him a good seat. And that's even more significant in their culture because we know from Jesus, turn to Luke 14, We know from Jesus that seating and places of seatment is a way of showing honor. This is an honor culture. There are many honor cultures around in the world today. But we know, even though here we're going to look at a banquet, where you're seated and who seats you is a way of showing honor or dishonor. Luke 14, verse 7. Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, when you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you will come and say, give your seat to this person. And then you'll begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friends, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So we know in the world that James is living in, seating is a means of sowing social honor. More so than, than in our day. Maybe back when there were box seats you can think of in the theater, special boxes, or today in sporting arenas, or there are VIP boxes, something like that might be in view um, of a way of showing honor. We don't really have that. And in general, people want to sit in the back, not the front. So it's so, so honor is in play here. They look favorably upon the man with the fine clothing, and they, they get him a good seat. And the contrast is seen in the the poor man. Just stand over there, whatever. Or even more shameful, the ESV has sit down at my feet. Literally, sit under my footstool. Which is either a pretty rude put down or if literal, even worse. Uh, Sitting under and next to someone's footstool is is a way of showing lowliness. Remember Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Subservience, submission. Well, now this person, people, you can sit down alongside and under my footstool. So either you've got a picture of people seated very finely, seated and reclining with their feet up. You can sit down on the floor next to my footstool. Or if it's metaphorical, you can sit down as my footstool. You can take this low place. 
But putting it in our context, practically, it would just mean somebody walks in off the street, they come in, and they get ignored. Maybe the ushers direct them out of this room to an overflow room. At the same time, somebody shows up in a brand new Cadillac, gets out in a three-piece suit, tan, hair combed, and the ushers recognize him. The church recognizes him as a wealthy businessman, and people are just moving out of the way, finding a seat for this guy. In one sense, that's all that's happening. Something like that. And James says that's great evil. So, we've got to try to understand why. Notice the then. Notice the then. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So he's got two initial charges for them. They've done two things. They've made distinctions among themselves. They've become judges with evil thoughts. How's, how does that work? How does that work? Well, the word for divisions could refer to in their own hearts and in their own faith. It's the word used for doubting back in chapter 1, verse 6. Inwardly divided. Ultimately, the, the double-souled, double-minded man. But I think more likely, it's the notion that they're making divisions, artificial divisions within the body of Christ. We know from our study of Ephesians that God's glory is seen in a multi-ethnic, multi-generational, multi-socioeconomic body. He is not glorified by white church, black church, rich church, young church, old church. He's glorified by the mingling of them all. Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female, aged and child. The body is stronger for having many parts. 1 Corinthians 12, if the body were all eyes or ears or fingers, it's a weaker body. What God's intending to do is to make for himself a people from every tribe, multitude, name on earth. And yet these Christians are making divisions. These are the seats for business class. You can go sit in regular class. They're making divisions. They're dividing up the body that Christ died to unify. When we make those types of arbitrary distinctions. Let me pause and make one other comment. I don't think the solution, and I don't think what James is condemning, is all forms of honoring. We're told, after all, there are people to honor. We're to honor our governors, Governor Reynolds were to show up one day. I think it would be wholly appropriate to show her honor. And someone said, why are you doing that? You're being partial. No, I'm obeying the Bible. Here, sit here. If, if someone who is laboring in our body or a missionary in another church showed up here, we're told biblically to honor such people. I think that would be wholly appropriate. There are legitimate recipients of honor. So he's not saying treat everyone the same. He's forbidding distinctions along these arbitrary lines. What God has actually taken measures to destroy these distinctions, we're reinstating them. He's taken down the dividing wall, we're putting it back up. That's what's being spoken against here. I do think there are legitimate recipients of honor in our body. People that if they showed up, it would be appropriate, done rightly, and for the right reasons to honor. This is not one of them. How much money you make how nice your clothes are, is not a valid reason to show someone. I mean, think about that. They're honoring him for no other reason than he has money, which means they're honoring his money. They're honoring wealth and gold rings. And he gets at their motives and their hearts. It's not just what they do, but why they do it. Notice that you've become judges with evil thoughts. T turn over to chapter 4 of James. That's lang similar language is used, I think, to help explain the charge he is making. James chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. There's only one lawgiver and judge. 
he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Here is no slander. I'm making unjust judgments against my neighbor. I'm speaking them to other people. Notice the concept of judgment. I'm, I'm declaring to somebody else, hey, do you know about so-and-so? And I'm making these judgments, and I'm declaring them, and I'm acting like a judge of the law rather than someone under the law, and it's evil. Here, other judgments are made. They're judgments of worth and honor and glory and dignity. It's a similar concept. We're sitting illegitimately as judges, judging not in a righteous way. The only judgments we have any right to make are ones that accord with Scripture. If somebody says something corrupt, we can say, hey, you shouldn't be talking like that. Who are you to judge me? God said, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. I'm not doing the judging. I'm pointing you to the law book. I'm pointing you to the law of Christ. We're not to be judges in any other respect than to point God's family members back to his standards and his rule. But here, divisions are being made in a body for which Christ died to unify, and individuals are acting as judges with evil thoughts. And I think the evil thoughts is key because they've adopted worldly values. They've adopted the, the metrics of society. Society honors wealth. You donate enough money to a college, they'll name it after you. They'll put a statue of you up. Money can buy social honor. It's as simple as that. You can buy honor freely. If you've got enough of it, you can buy it. So the world recognizes this standard. The world recognizes you can do something for me. The world curries favor from the wealthy. There's another implicit reason here. If you are nice to, suck up to, People with money, maybe they'll give some of it to you. Jesus talks along those lines to people who invite friends to dinner parties. Hey, make sure you invite the Johnsons. Maybe they'll invite us back to their place. I hear they throw lavish meals. That could be in play as well. Either they're recognizing the inherent worth of this individual because they have money, they've made something of themselves, or they're hoping to get some of it. Either way, it's corrupt and broken and ungodly. And they've become judges with evil thoughts. Finally, James is going to tease out the implications of this a little further with some rhetorical questions. And what you've got to understand here is this way of thinking. Because James tracks the actions back to the words, back to the heart. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth overflows. And he's really attacking the value system and the thinking that undergirds it. That's where you've got to root this out. And he's going to ask some rhetorical questions to try to show how their values and their thinking are completely at odds with God's values and even with reality. First, rhetorical question. Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom for which he has promised to those who have loved him? But you've dishonored the poor man. So the, the first question is to highlight the fact that you've got it exactly backwards. If we were to say there is any group of people God has chosen out to honor, it's not the rich, it's the poor. Turn, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I do not believe James is simply stating being poor is somehow virtuous. I think he's simply playing upon the fact that when you look around the church, certainly in his day... And even globally today, it is mostly made up of the have-nots, not the haves. It's just a fact. The Apostle Paul speaks to this directly. And you'll hear more about this next week from Jacob Moore. This is his passage. And I want to read the entire passage so you see this. The Apostle Paul makes it clear the fact that the church is made up mostly of the poor mostly of the weak, mostly of those viewed by the world as unwise, is intentional and deliberate. It's not accidental. It's part of the plan. 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, and here's the plan in simplicity. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. So God's on a mission not only to save a people, 
but to confound, to undo, to destroy the world's wisdom and might and discernment. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of the age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the wor- since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For the Jews demand signs, and the Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and a folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So get this. God intends to defeat the wisdom, strength, and nobility of the world, not with greater wisdom, greater nobility, and greater wisdom, but with, from the world's perspective, the antithesis. It's Samson defeating the Philistines, not with a sharp sword, but with the jawbone of a donkey. And here's the point. Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise, according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. There, there's some, but not many. Do you get it? The overwhelming majority of the church, the many of the church, are not wise. They're not powerful from the world's perspective. Verse 27, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. See, God's out to glorify himself as well in this process. And when a bunch of untaught, untrained fishermen turn the Roman world upside down. The glory doesn't go to them for their eloquence and their cunning and their strategy, but it goes to the God who works through them. When God defeats Jericho with an unarmed group walking around in a circle silently and then blowing some trumpets, you don't think, man, those Israelites have got some good strategies. You think, what a great and powerful God. It's the same type of strategy God keeps using. He wants to make it clear the victory is dependent on him. And so, consequently, we learn most of those God chooses. you got to get over that, by the way, too. You can't arrange the church so that most of them are poor unless you're doing some choosing. He chose what is weak. He chose what is low and despised. That's the logic James is assuming. Don't look around the church, brothers, he says. Don't you recognize that most of whom God has chosen are poor And he's chosen them to be rich. This goes back to the logic of James chapter 1. Remember, let the lowly brother exult in his high position. You may be dirt poor in this world. You may be despised among men. You are rich in faith. You are heir of a kingdom. Which God has promised to those who love him. By the way, that phrase to those who love him makes it clear this isn't something just true of the poor in general. Some social gospel Christians have tried to take this to speak of general virtue to all the poor, but he qualifies it. These are the poor who love him. This kingdom is promised to those who love him. So this is the Christian poor, the Christian lowly. He says, how could you reverse the standard? God has gone out of his way to glorify and exalt and bless and honor your blanks here. Has not God chosen to honor and bless the poor? Not all of them, but look at the global body of Christ and look back with a little church history and you'll see the truth of this. And then the point is this, you're, you're honoring at exact odds with God. God's trying to honor and bless the poor, the nothings, the nobodies. You're, he's got money and you're trying to honor him. You're, you're working at cross purposes. He chose this world's poor to be rich in faith. Your next blank, they're heirs of the kingdom. Promised to them that love him. Point three here. Such discrimination dishonors the poor man. Here's here's what he's saying. You are dishonoring the one God has chosen to honor. I'm going to make it really simple. You're working completely at odds with God's stated purpose. Has not God chose the poor to be rich? You've chosen them to dishonor. 
That's why you can't combine them. They're working in exact opposite directions. You can't combine this type of partiality with your faith because what God is doing in calling a people to himself is giving honor to the very people you're dishonoring when you adopt these world standards. When you adopt the world's way of thinking about money and status and prestige, when you become snobs. Such discrimination dishonors the poor man. This was a perennial problem in the church. In 1 Corinthians 11, we learn, they'd get together for their, their communion meal, and it was part of a whole meal. I mean, we do it in about 10 minutes with you know, a tiny amount of grape juice and a tiny piece of bread, but they'd have a meal such that some people were getting drunk. He tells them, don't stop it. Others, however, would show up, and they would have no food, and they wouldn't give to them. And so there's a communion where some of the bodies left with no food, no bread, no wine. And Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 11. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. So there's a perennial problem of dishonoring the poor in the body. Corinth. It's a shame you didn't bring something to celebrate the Lord's table. If you really loved the Lord, I guess you would. Pass the port. And Paul has to rebuke it. There are many ways that we can make those distinctions and dishonor those who have less and who have little. That's the first rhetorical question. The second rhetorical question is directed at the one they would honor. So so the logic of these two questions is this. First, God's chosen to honor the one you're dishonoring. And then the second one is going to be the one you're honoring dishonors God. He's trying to show them their, their, their basis, their thinking is completely upside down. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you? And drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you are called? So in the first, the, the, he's showing them they dishonor what God is trying to honor. Here, you're honoring those who are Throwing stones at your very Lord. In honoring them, you're honoring those who are the enemies of Christ. Whom willfully make themselves the enemies of Christ. They're actively blaspheming him. Trying to move quickly here. They oppress you. And again, I don't think this is a statement that every rich person oppresses. But certainly many do. They've got the ability to. And historically we know people with enough money can bribe Influence the courts. Jesus tells parables about poor people begging for justice. So James is saying, hey, who's doing the oppressing in the world around you? It's not the poor people. It's the rich. Who's dragging you into court? It's the rich. Not all the rich, but the ones doing the dragging into court in James' day are the rich. You got an example of this in in Acts um, 16:19, Paul uh, is interfering with some uh, a slave owner who has a, a demon possessed girl who um, is predicting the future, and Paul expels the demon from her, and she's not going to make any money that way. When her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them at the marketplace before the rulers. There's a picture of that type of thing. And and what he's pointing out is the insanity of honoring the very people who are, by and large, the class victimizing you, taking advantage of you, and persecuting you. It's pathetic, really. You're still buying into this world system. You still want their favor. You still want them to think highly of you. You still hold on to this system of values that is opposed to God, that God is thwarted and put upside down and destroyed. And yet, if we aren't careful... Some B-list celebrity, some business owner comes in here, and all a Twitter. And we forget that we belong to a different kingdom with a different value. They blaspheme the name by which we were called. These are people who are, by and large, enemies of Christ. We, we know from Jesus' teaching, not that it's impossible to be saved as a rich person, but it is hard how difficult it will be for those who have wealth 
to enter the kingdom of God. Mark 10, 23. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again to them, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Not impossible. Difficult. Not many. To use Paul's language in 1 Corinthians. Not many. So by and large, in James's day, the rich are not believers. And they're trusting in their wealth. Consequently, they're mocking Christ. Point three here. Such partiality reverses God's system of honor. Such partiality reverses God's system of honor. Remember I pointed out to you earlier that he calls Christ the Lord of glory. As we're considering who to honor, and I don't think the solution is honor no one, then we won't run the risk of getting this wrong. Rather, let Christ and his glory inform our understanding of honor. Listen to some of these passages. You know the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. We're, we will sing our closing song. I, turn with me to Philippians 2. I think I can show you this in its clearest picture. Never forget that the basis upon which Jesus Christ is glorified is our new ethic of glory. He models for us what is worthy of honor, laud, and praise. And when you see it, give it. But not when you see a gold chain or a gold ring. Actually, I'll just read from the beginning of chapter 2 in Philippians because he applies it first as an ethic and then he exemplifies it in Christ. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, and being in full accord in one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves, even if they have shabby clothing. I, I added that. It's not in my Bible. I think it's true. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Now, here's our, here's our new system of honor and glory. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Isaiah 53, there's nothing of his appearance that was attractive. We are saved by turning in faith and seeing as supremely valuable a crucified Jewish peasant. There's nothing externally attractive or beautiful about him, and yet we see in him the wisdom of God, the Son of God, our Savior, our substitute. And so we turn that value system on its head when you enter into the door of faith and when you trust Christ. And what James is saying is it doesn't flip back around then. It stays that way. So that the one who's greatest among you is the one who is the slave, just as Christ came as a slave and as a servant. We, we dare not undermine that and adopt the world's values and give honor to the dishonorable, to give honor to those who are opposed to God and to shame those who God is honoring. Let's call up a worship team and sing our closing song. Thank you.